Yes, I've been asked to provide a, a basic overview. Uh, almost over. Um, so let me just do a, a, a quick overview of the process, the final product. I don't really see the need to go through and read every one of the recommendations one by one. I think they're fairly self-explanatory, uh, but we certainly can, can go delve into that level of detail as you wish. Uh, most importantly, I want to leave time, as much time as possible, for the Council to discuss among uh, yourselves what you'd like to do next. So uh, a couple of the thoughts in terms of process. Obviously, the Council passed uh, Resolution 1307 back on December 18th, and the committee, a uh, seven-member committee, started uh, almost immediately thereafter. Uh, in the end, the committee met a total of nine times. It was over 25 hours of meeting time and then countless hours of outside prep time. Uh, many of the committee members are here tonight and they can tell you better than I how much time they all put individually beyond just the face time uh, as a group. It was quite an ordeal, I think. Uh, I was selected or elected, appointed as facilitator for the process, not a role I volunteered for, um, much less relished, but nonetheless I was pleased to help in that capacity and also helped in uh, the, the basic drafting of the report as well. Uh, the report is intentionally brief, uh, really so the Council can focus specifically on the recommendations. As I said, a number of the committee members are here this evening, and I'm sure they, they're pleased to share with you their thoughts uh, and expand further uh, beyond what the, what the report says. But it was intentionally left uh, quite brief, again, to focus on the recommendations. Um, also in terms of process, uh, the committee was very interested and concerned with transparency, so the, the meetings were all open to the public. They were taped and broadcast live through our local uh, TV. Uh, there also were uh, minutes recorded from each meeting, and I encourage you to look at that. You might uh, learn some things in terms of uh, specific votes offered, motions offered, votes taken, uh, so on and so forth. So the, uh, the complete record of minutes is included as one of the exhibits. Uh, the committee also created a web page through the town's website, and that was a portal <coughs> through which residents could communicate with the committee. I uh, consistently provided those, all those communications to the committee, and I'm quite sure a number of suggestions that came through that means made their way, uh, at least for discussion, if not ultimately as a recommendation. Um, essentially, the committee operated generally by consensus, though there were some specific votes taken, particularly on those substantive, more, uh, I'll say, controversial matters. Uh, votes were taken and recorded. As part of the process, the committee thought it was important to include, I'll say, mi minority opinions or reports. Uh, also, position statements were offered, uh, authored and offered by members of the, of the committee, and those can be found in exhibits C, D, and E of the report. Uh, again, those are prepared in the hand of committee members. I didn't alter them whatsoever. And that was a notion that I think was pretty important for the committee to ensure that all members had uh, their ability to make sure their thoughts and opinions were preserved, and that's how they chose to do it. Uh, the organization report uh, essentially, and, and this was generally true of uh, the committee's proceedings uh, um, throughout, they essentially attacked, uh, uh, attacked, approached the issues between beach-related issues and then town-wide. And if I had to attribute a percentage, I will say 80% of the conversation was the beach-related uh, and the town-wide pieces kind of uh, picked up at the end and, and moved fairly quickly. And as a further way to organize your thoughts, particularly on the beach-related issues, the committee early on identified nine threats to plovers that they wished to at least discuss, uh, not all of which uh, resulted in recommendations, but many of which did, and those nine threats are included in the report as well. The final product was uh, essentially 23 different recommendations, most of which I think are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, the breakdown is about 18 of them were beach-related, again, resembling uh, the majority of the discussion, and the other five were, were uh, essentially the town-wide issues, and the report kind of breaks those out or organizes them in the same fashion. Generally, on the beach-related recommendations, there was a kind of a science or a data-driven, fact-driven approach that the committee took. Um, the dates that are selected and recommended are not magical. There is science in support of those dates, and there are committee members who can certainly speak more eloquently than I as to the importance of those dates, but I did characterize the basic importance <coughs> and relevance of those dates in the report for your consideration, too. Uh, 
the basic concept was uh, this so-called release beach idea. And essentially it's based on the fact, again, on the science and data, that when the plovers aren't present, the issue of dogs on the beach is no more. And essentially uh, the concept is that uh, the latest nesting date recorded, I, I believe I'm saying that correctly, is July 15th of a given season. And so the notion is that if there are no, and help me out, uh, no birds, no nest presence at, at, on July 15th, a beach can be released and, and available for um, dogs off leash in some capacity. And that's certainly something for the council to be, uh, to further consider. Um, the other caveat to that is, or 40 days after, uh, after hatch. So it's conceivable that beaches uh, could be released uh, every year in the summer. It's also conceivable that if you back those dates up, say the nest occurs on July 15 and count 40 days, that pretty much consumes um, all the way through August. So, uh, but again, that was the rationale used by that basic approach. Uh, there's also a, a recommendation um, regarding designating uh, a beach, uh, the so-called co-op beach. This is uh, adjacent to the commercial fish pier. There's a small section of sand beach uh, that has a rock jetty on one side and the boat launches on the other. And the notion was to designate that area as uh, uh, you know, an opportunity for dogs to be um, off leash. That will require petitioning uh, the state to remove that area from the central habitat and that's a process we're still exploring, frankly. And also there's a notion of preserving some time in the winter months for dogs not to be allowed on the beach to allow folks to go down and enjoy the beach without dogs present. And that was that time is 11 to 2 on a daily basis. On leash. On leash. On leash. Thank you. Um, in terms of town-wide, um, essentially the committee thinks the current regulations are generally adequate. Uh, there's some suggestions to enhance the voice control definition by including the, the word sight or the notion of sight being part of that definition. There's the idea of a dog tag, dog tag program that uh, perhaps Councillor Donovan can better articulate. He was one of the lead proponents of that. Uh, that's a concept that um, is being used successfully elsewhere, but it still needs to be flushed out how we'd put it into practice here. As I said, most of the other recommendations I think are fairly self-evident and explanatory. Uh, there was a notion of establishing an ongoing committee to take up uh, some of those longer term issues uh, from by way of implementation. And the other piece is a number of recommendations, and I prepared a separate handout for you this evening. Um, contemplate the change of ordinances, and there are essentially three different ordinances that are touched on in one recommendation or another. I, I organized them in this way just to alert the council to the fact that the implementation of these requires a different process or an additional process in terms of, you know, drafting the language, first reading, public hearing, second reading, and if time is a concern is of the essence, I just wanted to highlight the fact that it would be terrific if, as a result of this discussion tonight, some general policy direction could be given uh, because the next step is to actually draft ordinance amendment language for your consideration at a future meeting. So that's, I kind of lay that out as the goal or expectation. Um, that's probably a tall order. There's a lot to get through in a short time. So I'll stop talking and turn it back to the council. And um, as I said, committee members are here. I think they're willing and able to come and address the council if you have particular questions. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I turn it back to you. Okay, who wants to go first? Comments? Discussion? Oh, I'll go first. All right. <laughs> Why not? Um, okay, so I, I'll dive into my thoughts uh, on some of these mm -hmm. that I have significant maybe difference of opinion on in, in just a minute. Um, the first thing I wanted to bring up is kind of shame on me a little bit that the first go around I didn't come to this realization, but here we are with the second go around. And the reality of it is the town of Scarborough owns almost no beach. The only thing the town of Scarborough owns is directly in front of Hearn Park. And Ferry Beach is owned by the state of Maine. Anything classically considered Higgins Beach is owned by the state of Maine. And the co-op is owned by the state of Maine. So 
I, I kind of sit here and go, well, if the state of Maine has an issue and wants us to do something, they own it. They're, they're more than free and welcome to do whatever they want, but the onus being on us is problematic. Because what we're really talking about, what we have left, is Pine Point, and we have folks that own to the low water mark. We're talking about private property at this point. And what I do not want to see happen <coughs> is these rocks. I do not want property owners lining up, staking no trespassing signs in their beaches. I, I think this is a very slippery slope for us to be walking right now. So. That being said, I think if we were to move forward with this document in its entirety, that's the slope we're walking down, that there's going to be pushback. We've already seen it in some of the emails with concerns from people that are private owners wanting to know what their rights are if we create this ordinance. So again, I caution everybody to think very carefully about how much push we want to have and how much pushback we're prepared to take on. Um, that being said, um, I'm going to go through maybe just the quicker points of that part of it. Um, I think the release date was a good idea, but I think it complicates things too much. I think when we make rules, we should have them very, the average person of average intelligence on a daily basis knows it's in season, it's off season. And you shouldn't expect people, especially tourists coming in, to be able to comprehend, well, this week it's this time that I can be here, next week it might be this time, and two weeks from now they might release it, and I think it convolutes it too much. I think it needs to be shorter and simpler. It's winter hours, it's summer hours. Um, certainly I can support taking our current practices for summer hours and moving them. Um, that means if we do want to take the step to saying, okay, this private properties that we're talking about, we're talking about a three-hour window in the morning in the plover season that we need to have presence of enforcement on the beach. Um, so that, that's my thought on it. Um, taking existing rules, moving it to the dates that we've been talking about, and then it's only three hours we're trying to work with. Um, you guys are all welcome to disagree with me in a minute, but... Um, <laughs> Um, Co-op beaches year-round as being the designated spot, I've already kind of touched on that. We don't own it. I don't think we even remotely have the right, nor will the state of Maine. We know how the state of Maine feels about dogs and off-leash anything. So I don't see us being able to get any wiggle room or any kind of agreement out of them in order to do so. Um, Site being included in the voice definition, I'm perfectly okay with um, under voice control. My, my only thing is, and in, in something that got touched on, and I think I got lost in translation when I was trying to explain it to you, I do still believe we need a definition of what delineates at large. My, my concern wasn't necessarily in the aspects of somebody walking down a sidewalk if they really want to let their dog run more than 20 feet down the side of Route 1, then, <laughs> so, you know, there's always somebody. But my concern lies in the person that has the dog that's a quarter mile away. And no reasonable dog on a windy day is going to be able to hear those commands coming from them anymore. So to throw a hat, you know, I threw a number of 20 feet out there. I said that as just a strictly <coughs> discussionary point. It could be 100 feet, it could be 50 feet. I'm not married to a footage. But there has to be a delineation of how far away an animal is from you, whether that's the beach, whether that's Memorial Park, no matter where you are, what that delineation is to, okay, if the dog's a mile away, it's at large, period. Um, that bad. Flipping through my notes. Sorry. Um, I liked all of the language that came out of the responsible dog ownership. I, I thought that was fantastic. I think that firms that up as far as the people that are concerned about being approached by an unwanted dog. Um, my only concern I had about was you had a segment in here about no more than two dogs off leash. Um, I just caution you that if the purpose of this was for the beach, it needs to state that because, again, when you become an ordinance, it becomes town law, and for the purposes of hunting, that's not going to work. And so state law dictates to us 
the ability, you know, you really can't regulate dogs used in hunting or service, period, as far as the state's concerned. So again, if, if this is something that you were looking for, it, the focus needs to be the beach. Um, not that I support that anyway, but <laughs> I just want to put it out there. Um, include allowances for the trespass. I greatly can appreciate that. I know that came out of the police department. Improve all signage, can completely support that. I think it's so utterly confusing when you walk onto the beach. There's eight different signs, but firm them up, put it on one sign, make it very clear. Every single beach access point, not just Herd Park. I think it needs to be at the beginning entrance of, you know, we've got six or seven alleyways that are public rights away down to the beach. I think it needs to be all of them. So very clearly mark it. Anything that could be considered public <coughs> access for any of our beaches, as well as all our town facilities. Um, I also want to include the one thing that I might say differently is if we could reach out and work with um, Scarborough Land Trust so that we might additionally have signage of whatever their requirements are posted on all of their properties that follows the same style and, and verbiage what they but the same size so that it's a recognizable sign kind of like when you drive down the road and you see yield to children signs they're very you know what that sign is by sight you don't have to read it to know oh that's that I mean, you want them to read it but it's recognizable as a standard um, enhanced focus on education and enforcement I absolutely agree um, horse beach permit I didn't know enough about so I just left it as a question mark for myself uh, formula education materials, condition of other agencies regarding, oh, cats, yeah, um, good luck keeping the cats in. <laughs> um, but absolutely, you know, some more education. Um, heightened works enforcement, heightened is great. Um, we be pretty surprised to realize we do that much as we do now. Um, I guess I'm trying to think. Best practice for bee tricking. What was the other big control animal? That, that's just more better signage. <coughs> I'm reading my notes. It starts me right from <coughs> chicken scratching. So here it's just the best practices. Trash collection. Oh, the tag program. I I like the tag program. This goes back to my enforcement. Um, you know, I, I'll be the first. One to say, I think we did do a poor job of enforcement, but in the same token, I think what we had in place wasn't enforceable. It's a, that, that was the first problem. I think the second problem is, um, you know, it, it would allow us the means financially, I mean, we, I'm on finance, so I have to look at the money, okay? Um, it would allow us the means to take on more responsibility to physically have a body on the beach. Um, we already hire for some beach patrol now. There's already somebody that's down at Higgins Beach on a fairly regular basis. We do have the animal control officer that would maybe perhaps mean changing his hours a little bit. Um, but also the tag program would give us some revenue, which is the finance part of it, to put another seasonal person in place. Um, I'm not saying a standing body on every beach for that three hours, but certainly, you know, the goal of the program is self-compliance, and you have a tendency to be a little more self-compliant if you're worried that somebody's going to come do a compliance check. So that, um, I do like that program. The only one thing that I would humbly ask is, I know you guys talked about Boulder, Colorado having a program, and that's what you list here. Um, I'd like everybody to remember that not everyone has access to the internet. I think the registration part and the materials part, being able to get access to it online is great, but I think it still needs to be made as a paper copy available, especially for our older residents that might not have internet and access that they can still physically come in, get a pamphlet, and that's the part that I do love is they get the information of uh, here's the packet of this is the town ordinance and this is what your expectation <coughs> are. You need to sign a consent form that you read all of those, understand all of those, and move forward. Uh, the other nice thing about the online application process is I do like that. That does take care of a little bit of the issue of the concern of our tourism folks that maybe are 
here for a week or two or for just the summer. Um, again, giving them access online I think is a great opportunity. Um, and it keeps it on a, on a kind of fair. Uh, that being said, I'm not going to dive into the other things because everything I said kind of comes as a whole package out of all of the things. So um, I do just want to make a quick note that um, in the information we all do have on our table tonight is the proposal from um, a resident, um, Joanne Mahoney. We do have her materials. Like I said, I, I won't go through the other three segments just because I did it all in the front. So um, I thought it encompassed most of it. So that's it for me. Okay. <laughs> all right, come on. Don't all jump. <laughs> 35 minutes. Okay, I'll go in. Um, first of all, I think the report is outstanding. There's definitely a lot of work that went into this. Um, and I want to thank everybody for spending the amount of time that you did on this. Um, Jessica brought up a good point about the ownership of the beach. I don't know whether that can really enter into our discussion at this point in time. I think it's, it might be a little bit too early, although it's got to be going on in the background. As we can see in the papers today, it's going on. Can you move that mic a little close, a bit close to you? Um, one of the things that concerns me about the beach ownership is if the state of Maine owns the beaches, um, do they control them, or have they given that responsibility to the towns? Do we know if who this holds title to uh, Higgins Beach from Can I? Champion to? I spent the greater part of yesterday playing around with the GIS assessor map, and the owner information clearly shows the state of Maine owning what we commonly refer to as Higgins Beach. Um, it owns the beach in front of the seawall and wraps up, and then there's a small break where there's a private owner, and then it goes state of Maine again, and then there's a series of, I think that shipwreck of private owners, and then the mitten shape, if you will, the very tail end of Higgins is state of Maine. Um, everything commonly shown on front of Ferry Beach to Prout's Neck, what we call the beach, the state of Maine, and the co-op all the way around and up, back up into the Nunsatch is, is co-op. I don't think anybody's uh, ever thought that the state of Maine owned anything other than down by the Spurwink River. Yeah, I, I've not done and so it would require exhaustive deed research, but I was not aware of the state's ownership of Ferry, no. for instance, or the portions of Higgins that you described. Clearly, the area nearest the river, I know they own. It's been commonly known. And if, so I, could, if I could just step in, as someone who's in real estate, a real estate professional, I never use tax maps. I never use GIS maps to tell me where boundaries are. I mean, that's a fool's mission, if you want to be honest about it. But you really have to look at our deeds and title. Um, and that's a whole bigger issue um, for attorneys and whatever to look at. I'm not saying that our GIS maps are incorrect, but you do have to be careful about when you're talking about who owns what and where. Wouldn't the assessor's office have that information? They would. They would. The GIS maps, that? I think, can be misleading. And I, Jessica and I had this conversation late yesterday, and I just haven't had time to do, and it would require a fair amount of effort to, to do the research. Right. Um, Clearly, there are specific areas that the state of Maine owns. I'm not aware that it's expansive as you just report. And I just said that's what's when you. Well, for instance, the state of Maine would, would assert rights beyond what they have if they had them. Right. The state of Maine owns the very end of the beach, uh, and it's that's yeah. pretty well known, and they assert those rights. And I can just tell you from firsthand conversations with the state, they've, they've talked about uh, the fact that they own it and talked mm -hmm. about the, the fact that they could and they've contemplated actually fencing it and closing it for access of all kinds. Right. Um, that's specific to that portion of Higgins Beach closest <coughs> to the Berwick. They've not had that conversation with me on other areas of town. And I think the Ferry Beach is confused by the fact that the state of Maine does own the vast majority of the marsh. That's a 
wildlife. Uh, Rachel Carson. Uh, no, it's actually no, uh, it's, no. it's no. not a protected area. It's a wildlife okay. conservation okay. area. Right. Um, so I think there's a bit of confusion there um, in terms of what the maps show. But the, but that being said, uh, the town under normal usage, or I don't know, what the, I'm looking at the lawyer sitting over here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we've always taken over enforcing laws on beaches and managing beaches and whatever, regardless of what these recent court cases have been. So to me, it's like, so what's our role, at least at this point in time, and, and what we can and can't do? And since I have the mic, I'll just throw in, my big question, as everyone knows, right along has been, I'd like to find a balance between protecting these the plovers and uh, having off-leash time under voice control for dogs as much as possible, the maximum amount possible. Um, so I, I, and I, and Council Holbrook, I would ask you if you've, what your thoughts are given, we do have U.S. Fish and Wildlife has been in the background because you've got a lot more experience on this council and have seen it from a longer period of time than I have as to what your thoughts are on what their reaction may or may not be. It's frustrating not knowing that, you know? I thought as anything shy of what their demands were isn't going to matter. If we don't do 100% what their demands were, mm -hmm. it's not going to matter. Mm -hmm. I might add I didn't like eight totally shits while I'm at Well, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I was going to add. I was going to add. You, you, yeah, you've never, oh, you were I've never, never in favor of that. And I was actually going <laughs> to add. the beginning. I was actually going to add that. I think eight foot. That's, you know, that's your guideline, I guess, but I can see longer leash. I mean, that if we go towards leashes, I mean, that's definitely, I'm not wed to eight foot either, but, I mean, and, and that's where I'm coming from is, you know, how do we strike that balance? And I would also add that I went to most of the meetings, the ones I didn't go to, I did watch on TV, and I do know the hard work that went into it and, and the emotions that were in the audience and among the group of people who feel very strongly on this, um, and, you know, obviously I want to take into that all into consideration, um, but I, I, I feel personally that I have a fiduciary duty if we're dealing with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and if, in fact, they, they're going to come down on us, heaven forbid, with not just fines, but some sort of an injunction or whatever, then where are we? And should we, do we act, the big question is, do we act proactively with some of the in, things that they've come up with, which includes leashing, uh, some periods of where dogs are going to be leashed on the beach, um, or do we just say, well, we'll do the best we can, we'll increase the enforcement, um, and let it fall where it may. I mean, that's, that's my conundrum. Can I personally. say something? Um, my feeling on fish and wildlife at this point, after spending the last six months with fish and wildlife, I feel like kind of over here somewhere. Um, I have sort of taken them out of the equation, on, in all honesty. Um, I completely respect my fellow counselors and, and other people that are still weighing in with fish and wildlife and using them as a reference. At this point, m my duty is to the residents of Scarborough. That's how I feel, very strongly. Um, and, and we've said this a thousand times, that vote were the residents of Scarborough. And that was a, a, a clear um, message, and I think it's our job and our duty now to defend the residents of Scarborough. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that may not be a very popular position, um, but that's how I feel at this point. And that's just from sitting back and watching all of, the, all of this unfold. Um, so that's how, that's where I, f that's where I'm folding right now with Fish and Wildlife. I just, it, and I'm not even, I'm not even considering them in, in the equation at this point. Add, add a thought to that. My, my thought too is maybe or maybe not, City of Maine owns a whole bunch of those beaches and can do what they want. My thought about this has been if they do come, I mean, you can always make a law more stringent. I, mm -hmm. I guess my point was shore up the enforcement, make it mm -hmm. a little clearer, work within what we have, because in the grand scheme of things, we haven't had massive dog issues 
between town wide aid. Mm -hmm. But I guess that was my point, you know, let it work a little out mm -hmm. with stronger enforcement, better education, a better means to enforce what we have, and then if later down the pike they, they really want to dig their heels in and force us into a chain, I mean, we can add language if we need to. It's a lot harder to pull those pieces back out again, so. Mm -hmm. well, what, are you, okay. what are you getting at? Are you getting at <coughs> keeping the um, regulations the way they are now and just add um, Tweaking enforcement. them a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, adding the enforcement, adding the tag program, which I think mm -hmm. gets a yeah. big chunk of the education yep. part of it yep. out there. Um, putting more actual enforcement into enforcing what we have, and uh, supportive of moving the dates <coughs> so that there's more protection for the plovers, but maintaining that three-hour window in the morning. That we have that now in the summer. So taking all the summer rules and just extending them out to, to be in that plover, was it April, whatever dates they are, the, the April to September dates. Right. And then, like I said, if it comes to it and we do get notice and whatnot, we can always add no that stringer part into it later if we need to. Because anything shy of what they asked for is going to be irrelevant. It's not yeah. going to be what they wanted. So do what we think is best and how we can enforce it better now. And if they force our hand, then they force our hand and we add it later. At that point, we won't have a say in it. it you know, if they do, I mean, we can't. I would assume that we've done all right to this point. We need better enforcement. If we can show that what we have has been working and we've improved upon it and made it better, I think that goes to a case to argue with them if they do file. It's exactly. But we've done well. Right. Exactly. Most, you know. And I think it's the whole um, enforcement. You know, enforcement is something that we've been talking about from the beginning. It's it's we've heard enforcement from every single side of this. Um, and I, my hope would be that if we do implement the tagging program, um, and we do have some more of that revenue coming in, then we can provide someone that can. Um, work with us on the enforcement side of it a little bit more. Well, I it, just don't think you can, I don't think there's any way that you can take what's come down the pike from the last six months and say dogs have to be leashed 24-7 and that's it. I just don't, I, there's, I'm never going to support something like that at this point. So. Go ahead. No. Uh, anyway, how how what what do you guys see for uh, increasing enforcement? Uh, you mean who's doing that or how Who, that what? works? How yeah. With Sorry another curiosity. with another animal. Con I mean, my my view would be an animal control officer okay. who knows what he's doing and has experience in this. I don't. I know that there's been some offers of some some volunteers and things like that, but I think the hard part with that is then you're putting a citizen potentially in not a great spot. Um, and I think that's kind of a large responsibility um, to put on somebody who's not trained for that type of stuff. Um, but ideally, in my perfect world, it would be an animal control officer. It's a little bit of a combo. It's Utilizing the animal control officer, officer we have now, right. we might need to in-house change things a little bit. Mm -hmm. That that's not really an ordinance, or, or it would be an in-house, you know, job description change. Um, but certainly, you know, utilizing the dog officer, uh, animal control officer we have now, we already have seasonal help that we hire down in, in Higgins Beach. Um, certainly, having that assigned to their duties as part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then a seasonal position, another additional seasonal position, using the revenue from the tag program, uh, more spe you know more specifically with the focus on the applying that to compliance and what. Right. I mean, if they happen to, be, I don't want to say solely that they're just compliant because realistically we could use another bike. Let's face it, we could use another bike cop down in Pine Point too. Oh, yeah. So absolutely, I mean, a adding the position of another seasonal. Yes, with the main focus being animal control, but. But That's potentially other uses other uses. Right. And, and I mean, I would agree with that. I mean, I've always felt that enforcement's been a major issue. It's always amazed me that we have 
my understanding is that we have folks that work, you know, a nine to three or nine to five or whatever their schedules are. Well, if I wanted to do something that I not supposed to do, I'd make sure I did it when I knew no one was around. And if I know what their schedules are, then I know when I can do it. So. And I will say that the <laughs> feedback that I have gotten from the PD, and, I'm, and I know that you, you know, other counselors have spoken to the PD, they're very willing um, to Fix work. Up their schedules. Absolutely, yeah. and to work with us and make this work. I mean, they also are here to help support the citizens of Scarborough. So they want to make, you know, they want to make it work for all of us too. So I would think that you know we would be able to sort of mix things up a little bit, and sometimes you have to go outside the box to make mm -hmm. things work. And I think that's this is definitely going to be one of those times where we're going to have to go outside the box a little bit. But well, I was thinking also maybe that um, the Plova coordinator could be combined with that extra right. position. Mm -hmm. You know that also help with the funding if that's possible. I don't know. I'm just wondering how we can provide even coverage for those three hours at all beaches consistently during the, the, the season. Uh, it's yeah. random. It's random. Compliance. They are you know, they, the program that's to be self -enforced. What that person's going to do. And then you have the threat dedicated. of, they might show up. I mean, I, 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 he's probably going to hate me, but I'm going to throw Dave Corbeau on the back <laughs> of the bus. He's sitting there down at Pine Point. I don't think you need to mention your own financials. <laughs> it's certainly not appropriate. No. But for ten minutes to scoot over and do compliance check, hey, show me your permit. Well, so here's a well, ticket. Just appreciate that they have full time responsibilities. I appreciate right. absolutely. Yes. That they're blind to everything I else. I don't. Yeah, I, I have to agree I with Tom. They have a lot of other responsibilities. I don't. You know, I mean, that's why I say that if it's just in the summertime, you have an added position yeah. that will um, that will you know, could actually, maybe, we would have to look into it, also uh, double as a, a PLOVA coordinator, <coughs> because he'll be there. Um, random checks of uh, different beaches, I mean, that's what, that it, it's going to have to be that person's responsibility <coughs> to be at the beaches, and you have your other animal control officer to handle the other things that are going on in town. Mm. Yep. Mm. Anything else? Uh, uh, it's it's no. my understanding, too, that we haven't done such a great job with fencing off the areas. Is that right? Well, that's – no, that. I don't know about that. It's I volunteers. Know. I think, I think it's so. uh, the weather, you know, the winds down the beach and stuff that right. can uh, knock them down. Um, it could be even um, foxes, you know, trying to get in there. But um, the uh, – yeah, I mean, the volunteers take care of that. Correct. Yeah, I'm, I've not heard that that's necessarily okay. a problem. Yeah. Once, once and they're, they're located, and they're, they're identified and, and kept identified throughout. Because okay. because I, I know one of the things with the your, you know, potential ordinance changes the two a 200 foot setback from the exclosures. So that's why I'm asking, who's doing those exclosures? You know, how precise are they? How do you measure 200 feet from them, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, I'm just. That's why I'm asking that. Issue, that yep. foot is a visual right. um, from it. Um. Which then begs the question from everything I learned in sitting through all those <coughs> meetings is when the chicks are running around, they aren't staying necessarily in one place. And I'm getting back to the protection of the birds issue. You're asking me? I'm asking anybody. Oh. Uh, I'm asking. No, I'm, I, I'm not. I mean, anybody sitting. Couldn't chime in. Uh, I think that has to go with their recommendation about how we do the beach raking. They're running around because they're looking for food sources. Mm -hmm. So I think with the modified beach raking program, that's going to help with some of that, that perhaps they're not running a quarter mile down trying to find a food source, that it's more there and in front of them. I, I could be mistaken, but I, that's the way I understood it. We don't do any beach raking at Higgins beyond uh, Morning Street. So... Uh, there is no disruption of their food source uh, uh, from morning all the way to the river. So that that's really not an issue. I'm, uh, I understand at uh, Pine Point, uh, when they have uh, nests, they have a 250-foot setback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't rake in front of it. The our practice is not to rake in front of the nest right now. 250 foot on each side. There's yeah. a 500 foot area of, uh, that it's not touched. 
Kate, did you have something else? I you want look like you <laughs> want to say something else. I have lots to say. Uh, um, I no, I'm I'm good with. We can just keep the discussion going, and I'll chime in when. Um, I guess maybe just quickly overall, you know, I I do like the tagging option. I think that definitely has to be looked at a little bit further and um, add some of the things that Councilor Holbrook talked about. We need it to be accessible to everybody, um, not just to people that can get online. Um, the dates look pretty good to me. Um, I just... I have to have, there has to be, because, and I, I have no problem saying that it has a lot to do with that vote. I can't support something that doesn't have off-leash time every day, something for these people. Um, obviously, it has to be during daylight hours. You know, we've talked about that. There has to be these people. They have to be able to visibly see <coughs> what's happening. Um, what exactly that looks like, I mean, it, a lot of that could fall into this. Um, I think it's an amazing amount of work what that ad hoc committee did. Um, I know that they uh, they got a lot of they got beaten on periodically, um, and I think sometimes the people that were beating on them weren't necessarily the people that were attending the meetings and watching the amount of work that these people did. Whatever side you fell on, it didn't matter. These people were working hard. Um, it was a ton of information that they had to process and get through every week. And I just was, until I attended one of the meetings, I had really honestly didn't fully understand the scope of work that went into that. So I think it was amazing. That being said, that's kind of where I fall. I need to see some sort of off-leash time during the day. Um, I'm willing to sort of, you know, negotiate that and, and where everybody else falls. Um, and I do like that tagging program. I think we're going to, I know we always have to come back to the financial side of things. We're going to need that revenue from that to be able to do some of these things and to be able to enforce some of the, uh, yeah, I'm good. And I'll chime in. When Jim? <coughs> thing that I don't understand is the IFW wanted 7 a.m., not 9 a.m., and that was one of the big deals with the taking of the plumber um, at the time that we should have not had it that way. Now, what I don't understand is continually breaking the laws that have got us in trouble, that being one of them. And I didn't know, and I guess, Bill, i got to address, address you uh, from this. How did we get away from the 7 o'clock to the 9 o'clock, or why? I'm not sure I understand the, the 7 a.m. Jim, I'm not sure I understand the 7 a.m. reference. The dogs are not supposed to be off leash after 7 a.m. And it was part of the infraction that we got a fine for, if I'm not mistaken. The committee made a recommendation to lengthen the 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. time frame which had historically run from June 15th to September 15th, no dogs on the beach, which is really was a people, people issue, not a plover issue. Uh, that was extended back to May 15th uh, as a part of recommendations by uh, members of the committee who thought that that would afford greater protection for uh, plover chicks that start to appear on the beach shortly after that May 15th period of time, because you get nesting and from anywhere from the middle of April to June 1st, and so then within four weeks after that, they're hatched, so they're out on the beach and they're everywhere. So that, but I don't think we ever actually addressed any 7 a.m. issue, not that I know of. Tom, do you remember? Do you remember that, Tom? The only 
7 a.m. has with me is I've, I've been told that that's when the take occurred. Just <coughs> that's when it, the incident happened. Uh, I'm not aware that that date has any other relevance. I don't recall it coming up specifically as part of any of the committee discussion, nor is it in our ordinance. I know it's not in our ordinance. You're saying fish and wildlife. It was part of theirs? Wherever the fine came from. I think you're recalling uh, part of the notice of violation included recitals of the incident. And I think in that recital, they may have included some details of the incident, including the approximate time it occurred. And as I recall, it was around 7 a.m. That's the only relevance 7 a.m. is to me. So I, I wish I could be more helpful, but I, I just don't, I can't. Well, I, I, I guess it would be fair to say that somewhere they have a time in their notes. I would assume it's, it, 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 and I know I assume isn't good, but it's got to be at some point during the day what they are looking for. I, I, time is irrelevant to them. To my understanding, their issue is dogs off leash. You could have dogs um, on the beach, but on leash all day long, and it would not matter to them. Um, I think I think that's a fair statement. Although they would far prefer us having no dogs any time, any kind. But I think they're trying to be realistic in their request. In their in the correspondence that I saw, they said, "Here's what we would like." No dogs. But that being said, here's what we'll accept. So it was sort of like that undertone that we get a lot, it seems like. Um, right. The time issue, I think, is something weather. we've constructed locally, partially to guard against people-dog conflicts in the height of the summer, and then to carve out some time during the uh, morning hours for off-leash time. Uh, that's, that's the only time I've seen times matter. And be relevant. Okay. That's all I have for now. I'd just like to uh, talk a little bit about this releasing process. Um, it's a very interesting process. Uh, but I'm not too terribly sure exactly how it's going to be handled. Is it handled by professionals or volunteers? But what I've been told is that it's people are going to be available all the time, and they're going to be checking the beaches, and they'll, they'll know when there's nothing around, and you can release the, the beach. Um, that begs a question. From April 1st on, couldn't we be doing the same thing? Couldn't we be checking the beaches to see whether there's anything there? If they there's are. Yeah, I, I believe historically we've had monitors. Typically it's coordinated <coughs> through Maine Audubon monitoring beaches from early April through through the season. And so I, at least from the conversation I witnessed at the committee level, I, I think the monitoring aspect can be done. We're doing it largely already. The real issue is how do you put the word out because that's potentially changing date every year. And I think Councilor Hopebrook brought that point up. That oh, it's I an think interesting concept. I think you can get around that pretty easy. Just get, get these great big balloons. It's a red balloon or a green <laughs> balloon. No, we're talking about like all that, sorts of ways to notify. Flags but if, if we could identify that there's, there aren't any birds that have landed in the nesting areas, it seems to me that you, we ought to be able to keep the beaches open until such time as a pair lands and then we change it. You know, I You're talking the period between April, 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 April 1st, 1st until whatever this is, this July 15th. Well, the significance of July 15th is that the data, uh, that's the latest date ever recorded of a, of a nest being started. Right. Uh, so that's that's kind of fact and science based. Uh, so presumably birds could nest any time up until that date. But you're saying if there's no sign of them even before that, 
why close a beach? Right. 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 I mean, if there's any sign of, of the blowers, we've got to protect them. But if there's no sign of them, and this releasing is kind of after the fact, after they've landed, after they've made it, after they've nested, the fletching has occurred and everything like that. My concern was it just seemed it's a big chunk of what if time. So what if it happens? Well, what if it doesn't? And then we've lost a good chunk of, of our summer <coughs> months that a rather large portion of our residents utilize. So for me, it, I just was struggling with closing that down and not having access to that at all on the what if. Well, we're basically closing, with these recommendations, we're closing the beaches to unleash dogs from April 1st to the earliest July 15th. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. April, May, June. It's three and a half months. And, and I think uh, I'll, spe I'll try to speak on behalf of the majority of the committee. The, the premise behind that proposal was to, that's the best way to assure best plover protection, mm -hmm. which was the chief charge given <coughs> to the committee. And I understand, I, I get that. I, I logically process that. I understand that. I know what, get what they were tasked mm -hmm. with. And um, I just, it's logically for me, it's hard for me to justify to a resident that I have to answer to. <coughs> That's a, a large chunk of, I mean, let's face it, Maine doesn't have, <laughs> a, you know, a large chunk of time where we, where we can be outside and, and running and happy and, um, to me being able to justify <coughs> to a resident that, I'm sorry, but three and a half months, you can't have your dog unleashed on this beach because there might be, there might be a bird. It's just, it's, I find that hard to justify. <coughs> can't, I mean, we've been, geez, you and I, I mean, we've been, do, we've been doing this for a long time, yeah. a long time, and it's, it has become emotional and um, intense at times. I just, I, 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 can, I can't support something that doesn't at least, we keep saying we have to take care of all of Scarborough, right? I mean, that's kind of been our, that's kind of been our thing since the beginning was we wanted to take care of all of Scarborough. That includes the dog people and the non-dog people, the people that want to walk on the beach, um, that, can't because they're afraid of, of dogs. And quite frankly, I feel like if you're giving dogs three hours in the morning and then the whole rest of that time is for anyone else that wants to use the beach, I just feel like that's not an unreasonable compromise. I understand that we have to protect the birds. Mm. I feel like somewhere in that, if we see something that, if we see a bird that comes, maybe we do need to close that beach at that time once one has been spotted. But to close it for almost four months on the off chance that there might be a bird, I just, I can't, I, logically, I, it doesn't make sense to me. Would you okay. support the concept of, of the triggering date being based on the identification of plovers being on the, on the beaches? So you're saying, as of, as of right now in, in this world, the beaches are open, right? And then we spot a, a bird, a nest. Well, the bird, right? I mean, So is that Maine what you're Arbor asking me? And then do we close it? Is that what you're saying? Well, Maine Audubon uh, uh, is out there three or four times a week doing an evaluation right. of whether plovers have arrived. Mm -hmm. And these are biologists. And they're under contract with inland fisheries to do this work. This is not some freebie they're doing. They're <coughs> this is professional work. So they know when the birds are present on the beach, mm -hmm. on each of the beaches. And so I thought what you were suggesting was that a triggering event for placing dogs on leash would be once the plovers are present. Right. If we know, if we know for a fact there's, there's birds there, in other right. words, 
So what you're saying is then you would go from, you would <sighs> then remove that three hour in the morning off leash just, time just and then put leash. it on leash, leash time. Yeah. Once, it, once the bird is <coughs> the birds are right. Once the birds and are there. And that's just confirmed. Right. Yeah. Because that's, it down. that can be pretty clearly identified. Until July 15th? Is that when we know <coughs> that they then move on? Or, well, what happens or is, is that just till? If, if those birds don't nest, uh, then they probably will migrate to another beach, and they would be gone. Right. But uh, up till July 15th is the period of time when they are susceptible of nesting. So I guess that once you identify that the birds are there, um, uh, it's likely that they are going to be there right. for the duration. Of the summer? That, yeah. Right. They, they will <coughs> make an effort to nest. doesn't always work out for these critters. So, you know, uh, right. that's, that's one of the things that you, you can't tell. But once they're there, I mean, I could see why you would take the position. And because some of our beaches have had very little presence. Or not. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I think the... Um, the Ferry Beach area has had very, very little presence for a long period of time. Pine Point also hasn't had any huge presence in recent years. Uh, historically, Higgins Beach has been very good. I mean, it's really been an excellent habitat. So I could see how you might want to gravitate towards something that says the date would be set based upon uh, the arrival of birds, because mm. if they never arrive, right. there's some logic in what you're saying. And I, I see that as akin to, I know this is going to sound a little crazy, but flagging beaches for red tide, because we do that now. You don't know when red tide is <coughs> going to be here, not be here, whatever, but when if it is <coughs> present, then they... Town, town manager, and signage would be posted. Where the um, it is, I mean, it's obviously yeah. an effort to try and compromise uh, a, a, a situation where you don't want to be totally theoretical about whether they show up or not. Mm -hmm. Have the right. in season just pass by with <clears throat> with no one, ever, no birds ever showing up. So I mean, it's it's not it's not illogical to to think in those terms. Right, but uh, I'm just worried that if we don't do, uh, I think they were pretty clear on what they wanted before, and if we don't do what they want, uh, I don't think it's going to, well, maybe I'm wrong, but <laughs> I don't think it's going to matter. I think they're going to come right back and say, no, he, this is what we wanted, and this is what you're going to I think what Jess said earlier yep. was that um, if it turns out that we find ourselves heading down a path, with the service 
that is going to be detrimental to the town of Scarborough, then we have the obligation to protect the town mm. from any undue impact. And I'm thinking about <coughs> uh, the, the pr protracted litigation, mm. uh, uh, fines, putting ourselves in a in a in a unreasonable risk position. Those are the things that I've heard all of us speak to. And so, uh, do we, any of us really know how the service will treat with this? Not sure. But uh, uh, we can always gravitate toward a more restrictive uh, provision if it becomes necessary. But on the other hand, I think if at the yeah. heart <coughs> of what we do is consistent with the spirit of what they want, mm. then I think that's a good step. Yeah, if I, I can't say for sure. My sense is on its face, it probably falls short of their expectation. But one of the guiding principles of the committee is that when taken in concert with all the other recommendations, I think we can offer a very strong argument that we're actually providing better protection to the species. Remember, they mm -hmm. came to us on the narrow issue of dogs on the beach. There are a number of recommendations that extend to many other threats, some of which are far greater. I think so, yeah. So it, it may be a compelling argument when considered <coughs> with the package of proposed changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, well that's, um, you know, and, and right now we're in the midst of, um, it's, and it's a bad position to be in, of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, we're pitted between <coughs> our citizens as a council and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife doing what they want to. It's a bad place to be in. I don't like it. And um, the way I feel about this is, um, you know, uh, I've heard all kinds of explanations on the vote. And I still, um, I think the people said no. And if uh, the Fish and Wildlife come after us, then um, we have to, you know, deal with the punishment that is dealt to us. Um, we, we accepted uh, as the council, the five of us, we voted to accept the petition um, and ratify it. Uh, we ratified and accepted the final vote of the citizens. Uh, I know there was o a little over a thousand that voted for the ordinance. So I said, you know, somewhere is in there. Um, there must be a happy medium that we can find that is, uh, you know, a... Uh, compromise. Um, I know some of that, um, some of the committee's work was a compromise between U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but I'm not sure if that's good enough for the citizens. And the last thing I want to see is this town turned upside down again and everybody all upset mm -hmm. and going through this whole thing again uh, just turns my stomach. It, it's like, you know, I'm at it's it's not worthwhile, I don't think. But um, I I just I have a feeling that we should you know I myself personally um, should honor the vote of the people, and I've said that before. Um, I do support the tag system. Um, I think that would that's going to help um, law enforcement if you have a bright colored tag, a fluorescent tag, with the year on it. And the law enforcement person can say, okay, that uh, they've gone and read the material, acknowledged that they um, know what the rules are, and they signed off. And the animal control officer can say, okay, so without going and hounding people, do you have a permit? Do you have a permit? No, there's that bright tag. Oh, no, he's got, they went and did it. Um, that person, there's no tag, so he goes and approaches that person. Do you, you know, have the tag? And it's like, no, well, you're in violation of our law. And, you know, the, I meant the minute um, something happens um, but that's a violation, they lose the tag for that season. Try again next year. Um, just, you know, some ideas. I meant there's definitely education still. We need to do better on that. Enforcement is definitely an issue for me. I know what the, the deal is with enforcement. I think we all do. And we have to do a better job in enforcement. Almost like, 
you know, giving everybody a second chance to get this right. I mean, it, like I said, it probably is not going to be um, too palatable for U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but it's, um, it's the position that we're in now. Um, what was the other thing I wanted? To, um, yeah, off-leash time seems to be awful important to a lot of people in Scarborough. And, um, you know, the, the whole thing is there's some people that say they want to keep their dog, they don't mind them being on a leash. Well, okay, then you don't need the tag. You don't need the tag if you're on a leash. If, but if you want to be off leash, your dog has to behave and not be harassing other dogs, not harassing people, <coughs> and not chasing plovers and taking that chance again. We also have to look at some way to turn this around. And I don't know whether it's possible because we haven't looked into it. I don't know. Maybe the committee did discuss it and I didn't catch it. But the, a person that violates uh, and has a take um, they don't get off scot-free. There's got to be some penalty for that, you know. Um, uh, what it is, I don't know. That's why I say I think we need more time to get this right this time. And um, I know there's two sides of this. I've heard um, councils here say similar things that, that I did, um, that they want um, off-leash time, enforcement, all the stuff, and some of it, is not in line with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I hear that there's probably three or four of you that are in favor of moving forward to satisfy U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So, I mean, it's a debate that's this. We're not going to. We're not. I. I didn't think we were going to make it. <laughs> but, um, it's too big an issue. It's too. Big, it's. It's. You know. It's a hot potato. Every. You know. It goes quick. Having a committee going forward a good idea, like that can look at the issues. Um, Who's going to want to be on it at this point? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> no, I, bet, that's sort of I bet we could. I bet we could actually find some people that might want to be on it. I yeah. have some of their emails. <laughs> so, um, um, do, do you know what I'm saying? Though it's like such a right. it is. It's such a big, complex issue. Well, and you know, I think in 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 um, hindsight, I think. We, we all really originally the first time thought we were doing the right thing. Obviously not. Yeah. So the uh, how do we move forward with this? And, you know, like I said, there's all kinds of reasons. I hear all kinds of reasons why the vote was the way it was. I don't believe that that many people voted against it because it was, you know, just too far reaching. I think it was the whole package and part of it was we heard over and over again um, don't let the U.S. Fish and Wildlife tell us what to do and I think there's a lot of them votes in that 2800. That's 73 percent. I think there was a lot of votes in that that said the stand our ground with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I and mean, we talked we about, tossed I mean, this around right, a we, lot. We talked about that, and, and we talked about that from the very <clears throat> beginning, and, and going back to before the vote and before mm -hmm. all the discussions. And um, you know, we've said this now probably a thousand times. Like, you can't change the process and how it happened before and and what transpired with all that. But we can learn from it, and we can move forward. And that's what we have to do. And we have to try to move forward in a positive, constructive right. way. Um, and I think. We're taking the first steps toward that. I hope. I hope that's that's how people will feel. Um, I yes, I, I absolutely. Seven years. This is. I mean, I've been through uh, a few um, hot issues yeah. in seven years, and this has got to be the, the most difficult to deal with. Um, there's a lot of emotion flowing in this on both sides. All of what we said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think we need Make to do, sauce. Well, I think we need to do this again. I don't I, think I don't think we're even close to being done. I think we have to do this again with maybe maybe giving all of us some time to go through all of the recommendations more and then come back with our own variation of that. I mean, is that too? Um. <laughs> all right. Well, Bill, let, let's hear from you for a minute. I mean, if if. I mean, I feel like the the proposal that the committee made made a lot of sense, and yep. you've, I've talked about it for <coughs> several months, so I don't need to really repeat it. But 
<clears throat> I also would like to see us have the strongest possible statement come from our council mm -hmm. that uh, expresses that we're kind of together on this. Uh, I think that the town deserves that. So uh, the proposal that I thought that we would uh, wait until uh, enact the proposal that is made that is mm -hmm. supposed to be effective April 1st until <coughs> birds actually show up uh, is at least a credible compromise. Uh, and I don't know, and I thought I got a sense from sort of this end of the table, maybe that, that might make some sense, and I didn't know if at that end of the table that would be acceptable. So I throw it out. I, I'm sorry, to enact yeah. what? I'm, I'm just... To uh, enact an ordinance that would defer <laughs> implementation of the dogs on leash provision from Ap the April 1 date that stated to a date that would be, de would be determined by the uh, presence of plovers showing up on the beaches. I want a solid date. I, I don't want wishy-washy dates and maybe yes, maybe no. I want solid dates. I want to know what day I can be there at what time, whether there's a plover there or not, and maybe my dog's on a leash and maybe he's under voice control, but I want a date. I think it needs to be clear. Well, I don't know how others feel. So how do you feel about the releasing dates? I don't even want to get, I don't want the town to have the liability of that because, again, I don't want to, I want to set, be here or you can't. I think it needs to be black and white so people can reasonably understand the expectation of where they can be when. I also don't want the liability for the town is if a plover happens to fly by that day and land and, oh, no, a dog took it, Mm -hmm. Well, we said it was plover free, and now we're liable again. So I want, you know, rules about when we should, when we shouldn't. Well, that's why we should. that's why the service has April one to August thirty one, for that very reason. So I mean, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I um, I guess my my intention is if everybody's a little unreasonably happy, then you met somewhere in the middle. So I don't think. We're gonna make fish and wildlife happy, no. and I don't think we're gonna I make the dog owners that. happy. And I think we should be somewhere in the middle of it, and everybody should be reasonably unhappy. But I think it needs to be clear as, a, as far as what we send out, what we change needs to be clear and precise, and what is our expectation. Uh, I I agree with Councilor Holmer. Fair and reasonable. I've got a come up here and unfortunately there's going to be some people that fall off on either side with what they think is fair and reasonable. Um, I think that we've got to be very direct with the with the the dates. Uh, I don't like wishy-washy things either. You know, it's, it's this or it's that. Call it and that's fine. Because um, I can see us being in trouble <laughs> like she said, with a bird flying over, the Audubon Society being there, and all of a sudden it's, whoops, and we're back in the situation again uh, that we don't need to be. Um, the the one point that I would that I would like to bring up, uh, not to oppose mm -hmm. Councillor Holbrook, but one thing. Available to these people to give somebody excuse, someone not a reason but an excuse to oh I didn't know that. No, if the if the tag program is implemented, they will know that because they've signed for an off-leash dog. They've read the materials. Yes, you know but how, how are they going to find out about it? He's, he's talking about. Well, I think that the renters are talking about the renters. Yes. Yes. We're gonna have a nice big sign on every people, point. I would, you know, that's part of the educational. That that would be part of the educational program that we reach out to uh, 
uh, people who rent their houses during the summer, um, in owners, uh, motel owners. Um, that's, I, I don't think it would be that r tough to do. I just want to make sure it's going to get done. I think we talked about this before, you know, um, very briefly. I, I think during ordinance, I think it was, uh, we had a pamphlet we made up for the VIPs uh, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, yep, it was that yeah. Well, the uh, police bi pol yeah. bicycle police down yeah, the beach. Right. Six or eight sided pamphlet. Yes. I don't. i have not. I, I, dates are not an issue for where I stand on this. So, <coughs> I, I mean, I still believe that there has to be some off leash time. So for me, dates is not an issue. I mean, <laughs> dates with. I, I guess. Stipulation. Clear it up. Dates with current usage is what I'm looking for. Okay. So what the current summer usage allows right. for in the expanded dates is where I'm at. Right. What was that again? I, where I'm at is to take currently what we allow for in the summer months, yep. which is we have three hours in the morning, nine to five, they can't be there, any dogs, and then five to dark or is it dark. five to nine? They can be on the beach, but they got to be on a leash. Right. I want to take what the current summer conditions allow for and just expand when the dates are. So take that current usage and move it to the April 1st date on this side and Labor Day, was it Tuesday after Labor Day or Tuesday after Labor Day. Um, so I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, Bill, you had you wanted to weigh in. Now. Well, I, I was wondering if uh, I think we probably agree on a lot of what's in here beyond the summer rules. Mm -hmm. So, to just to give Tom some guidance so that he can move forward, I'm thinking that there may be a lot of of what's in here that we might actually be able, be able to say, yeah, there is a strong consensus that these rules go in the right direction. So uh, just looking at the time and yeah. the fact that we may need another meeting to actually bat this around because I think there, there isn't a strong, obvious consensus of where to go with the summer. So I'm just wondering whether or not we, we let Tom at least get going on ordinance provisions typical town setting and it's easier to get our smaller group together than it is to do all of this at one time. Uh, I think we're the experienced counselors. I'm going to either way to hammer it out in a workshop setting or defer. I already threw you under the bus <laughs> and said maybe we ought to go through ordinance with it. The only, the only fear I have with that is that ordinance is only three of seven. And yeah, so this is a committee of the whole. Developing something that doesn't have you know, past muster with Right. Rest, so. Yeah, I'd rather come back and have the seven of us continue to so thrash we'll, it out. So we'll continue with another. Okay. That's fine. Uh, well, but I, I think I a lot of the other things. I kind of feel, things. you know, that, you know, I meant I, what you said was, you know, there'd be three. Um, well, I, I, yep. There's four. Well, one alternate. Yeah. But. Um, I think maybe we're better, would be better off having the seven of us still. I'm happy with that. Oh, I guess, um, <coughs> yep, yeah. oh, so when? This next question. I would, I would say relatively quickly so that we can get some of this stuff, if, uh, since some of it is education, that <laughs> needs to be cultivated. So what I would say as soon as we can. You mean just hold a special meeting where we do a workshop? <laughs> Next What's the criteria um, for public notice on the workshop? I mean, another one. Twenty-four hours, technically, legally. Oh, okay. So I, I don't think that's a bar. I, mean, I think it's really looking at your schedules and seeing if you can carve out a couple more hours. 
Jesus. <laughs> it better not be my nameplate. <laughs> so what was that? Maybe the problem is to get yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that then. See what we can work out. More than an hour before. Because I think Kate's right. Sooner than sooner than later. Yeah. Let's keep going. All right. So, uh, do you want a five-minute break? Yeah. Okay. We'll adjourn for five minutes and return to ten. Oh, okay, ten minutes. So twenty-five up. Twenty-five up. Okay.